are, have gathered there in Jerusalem and anticipating something they know not yet what it's going to be. But God said the Spirit will come. And ready or not, the Spirit of God does come and visits them and says, so you think resurrection was something? Oh! Watch what happens next. And so first, there was sound, noise like a violent wind. Filled the whole room. And then, then the scripture says what looks like fire began to descend and sat in on their heads. Now we can't do the fire thing, that's against fire code. But as they sat there and they began to look and their mouths opened and what they wanted to say was, watch out, your head's on fire. But that's not what came out. This was. Not very comforting, was it? You just heard the Lord's Prayer spoken in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different languages. The point being is that the languages. Suddenly people were hearing the good news in their language. Now, much of the time, particularly as we read the Gospel of John and as good Baptists, Baptists have tended to focus on the comforting side of the Holy Spirit. I cannot tell you how many times over the last several weeks as we have been engaged with our son and the news there and others of you have come and there have been other issues that you've been dealing with and people would say, I don't know how I would get through this if it wasn't for the presence of God bringing me strength and comfort. That is certainly there. The Spirit of God brings us comfort, especially as we look at John. But in Acts... There's nothing particularly comforting about the Spirit at all. It blows in like a violent wind. It sets things on fire. And it creates in people actions and behaviors they never even dreamed of. For you see, this come alongside Holy Spirit seems determined to push those first followers and us beyond what they and we can imagine. This is the Spirit in Acts. And today is Pentecost Sunday, when the church celebrates the coming of the Holy Spirit to begin to move among the followers of Christ in the church. But let me remind you of something very powerful. We read at the beginning of our service, the Holy Spirit has been hovering over this chaos since the beginning. It's not anything new that the Spirit came down. The Spirit of God has always been at work. But here it showed up in a powerful, powerful way. And over the next few weeks, we're not just going to talk about the Spirit today. Sorry. I know we're Baptists. We want to get through this one and get on to something more comforting. But we're not going to do that. We're going to spend the next four to five weeks watching this spirit in Acts as it moves and pushes and drives those early followers of Christ as they witness, as they serve, as they go out on journey, as they grow in their understanding of God. It is incredible how uncomfortable the spirit makes those early believers 
And what the Spirit did then, the Spirit still desires to do today. For you see, we have been joined by baptism into communities of faith that look for and should expect the Holy Spirit to come alongside of us and shake things up, preparing and equipping each of us and all of us to share this disruptive, surprising, life-giving word of grace of God who will not rest until everyone, everyone understands God offers abundant life. Wow. This is, this is such good news. Hello, is anybody out there? I have a question. If indeed from the beginning of time and there and on out, the Spirit of God is hovering over the chaos, is empowering, is driving people, the followers of Christ, I have a question. Why is it that by all accounts, all accounts, all people who study religious life, that Christianity is declining in first world countries. You take any number, you take any measurement, you take any data, and in first world countries, Christianity is dying a slow death. Countries that are very wealthy, countries that have a lot of power. But on the other hand, I also question why is it that Christianity is flourishing in third world countries? Countries marked by extreme poverty, intense conflict, disease. Why is it that if you go south of the equator right now, you're going to not only hear about the Spirit, you're going to run smack dab right into it. Maybe we don't experience personally and collectively the Spirit's immense power because we have decided we can trust in our own abilities, in our own possessions. You see, if you listen to the language of our country, it's about power. It's about control. It's about being in charge. And we are. Who needs the Holy Spirit? Maybe we don't know the Spirit's enlivening of our daily existence because we find our security, our comfort in what we have and in what we do and in our ability to stay in charge. Could all of this be because we have forgotten that Pentecost is not as much about what God has done for us as what God now wants us to do in the world? You see, God says, okay, you're my people. Don't worry, I'll take care of your need. Now, get up and get on. And that isn't nearly as attractive to us. I remind you, especially in the Gospel of John, as Jesus had thousands, he had just fed 5,000 plus with that miraculous meal. And people said, oh, that is so wonderful, Jesus. So wonderful. Do something else. In fact, we're going to follow you all the rest of our lives. And Jesus says, well, okay, that's great, but let me tell you what that means. Go and read it. It's in John. And Jesus begins to tell them what it means to be a follower of Christ. That it's not sitting around and showing up for dinner. It's about getting up, getting on, giving your life, and letting God do something through you. And do you know, do you know in the Gospel of John, all of those thousands left? Go read it. It's not a very good church growth encouragement. Jesus speaks the word of truth about what it means to follow him and thousands leave, in fact, all but just a small handful. And Jesus turns to them and says, okay, you guys want to go too? And Peter voices the great truth. Lord, where would we go? Only you have the voice and words of truth. 
You see, somewhere we have to make a choice as the followers of God. Are we going to live our life by the words of truth or by the words of convenience and comfort and when it fits our schedule? But since the beginning of time, God has given this gift of the Spirit. And so what is it exactly that the Spirit comes and gives to those early believers? Is it this super excitement? I know sometimes as Baptists, our only experience of the Spirit is when somebody gets slain in the Spirit. We've heard those stories. How many of you ever seen somebody in the floor speak? I've been there. And yeah, it's a little unnerving. Or somebody, we call about them jumping the pews, running across the top of them. I can remember as a kid hearing, boy, did you hear about that church down there around the corner? They jump the pews and bounce off the wall. And we as Baptists go, oh, okay, thank you. Don't worry that. I'm not here to critique anybody else's worship. That's their heart before God's. But I am here to say, maybe that's what we think. Maybe the Spirit just fires us up so bad that we just run out of here screaming and hollering. But I remind you that in Acts, and what we're going to discover is that the Spirit, yes, empowers the people of God and does give them a sense of commitment, and there is a sense of excitement, but it is in the day to day Today, today, mundane jobs of living. We're going to discover that. It's not always about a a super duper high. We're going to discover as we go, sometimes they're thrown in prison. Sometimes they're just doing their job, but they are listening to the Spirit. And suddenly in a mundane, ordinary day of their life, the Spirit steps in and says, hey, let's do this. Something incredible happens. Is it just this gift of power? Yes, Jesus promised that last week. You will receive power. But it is not power as we understand it. We hear power and we think, yeah, bring it on. I want some of that. But this is power that finds its strength in suffering. This is power that finds its power in sacrifice and in giving you see maybe that's not what we want either so is it super excitement we could all use a little bit of that too many times i hear some people say you know the church today seems like eeyore hello i've got good news for you jesus is alive And do we need the power of God? You bet we do. But maybe when all is said and done, the gift that we get on Pentecost is not the gift of superficial energy or excitement. It's not the kind of power that the world thinks of as power. Maybe the gift that we get on Pentecost is the one gift that we most desperately need and that our world needs. For the gift of Pentecost, you see, is the gift of something to say a word that is spoken into the brokenness and into the tragedy of the world that is unlike any other word did you notice verse 4 I believe it is did you notice what happened when the spirit was received upon the people they went outside and did what they spoke they got up they went outside and they spoke a word the word It talked and the whole world heard the good news in its own language and in its own behaviors. For you see, as Joel says, your sons and your daughters and the young and the old and all will have a word to speak. A word that says that life is stronger than death. That hope is deeper than despair. That every tear will be dried and that the powers of this world have been overcome by the power of the resurrected Christ. You see, when you're a first world country and you've got a lot of power and you've got a lot of everything else, 
What do you need with the Holy Spirit? When you're a third world country, and you have nothing, the Holy Spirit is everything. You see, members of the violent wind congregations are under no illusion that they have what it takes to speak this word into the world on their own. We know it has to come from God, but instead they count on the Spirit to guide them and to guide us as we go out to speak and to serve, as we travel on this journey of faith and as we continue to learn about God. And as we do this, we find that the Spirit is everywhere. Not just in one or two services a year when a really gifted speaker fires us up. Or when the music was especially good. It's especially good every week if you're listening. No. We find that the Spirit is everywhere. It's in the grocery store. It's in a mission activity that you take time and set out of your way to go and be a part of. It's in the beauty parlor around the corner. It's at a kitchen table. When you or your family or your next door neighbor comes in with tears streaming down their eyes because something tragic has just happened and the Spirit is right there. You see, it's at your place of work It is everywhere you go, nudging and directing and empowering you to live and speak the words of life. How do you know it's there? Because wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, people's lives are being changed. And so I want you to join me. I am deeply concerned about the life of the church in America. I am deeply concerned about the life of First Baptist Church of Clinton. And so I want to ask you to ask the Spirit to open our eyes, to open our hearts, to open our minds, to open our wills. Will it be unsettling? You bet. And if what we're interested in as a church is settled and predictable, we'll get that. A.W. Tozer, he's been gone a while, but he, a long time ago, he, a long time, in, in almost any again individual that you read about the Spirit. But he summed it all up in this way. If the Holy Spirit had come down on Pentecost, fired them up, and then had withdrawn from that early church, 95% of what they did would have stopped. And you and I would not be sitting here today. But conversely, he said, and others... If the Holy Spirit is to be withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would just keep right on going. And no one would know any different. Is this what we want as the people of God? Is this what you want as a follower of Christ? That the Holy Spirit really makes no difference in your life? Because that's the question. And so at our next business meeting, I'm going to bring a recommendation that we change the name of our church to the Violent Wind Baptist Church. I'm just kidding. Or maybe I'm not.
Father, we come again asking forgiveness. Sometimes we just do it out of ignorance and we don't know that we're not listening to the Spirit. We are indeed attempting to be the church is the best way we know how, the best way we've been taught and what we've grown up with. But maybe somewhere along the way we just stopped listening. Your spirit is still hovering over the chaos of our lives and the lives of our world. It's actually your world. There we go again. It's our world, God. We want to fix it. No, it's not. It's your world. It's your church. It's your mission. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill this place. Fill our hearts. That we might be your church in this place. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. We invite you today to come and respond. To respond to the Spirit.